Well, thank you all for joining us for today's Nardon Family Seminar, Creating a Post-Soviet Russian Market Economy Through American Eyes. I am going to turn it over to Sheila Puffer. She is a University Distinguished Professor of International Business at Northeastern University's Damore McKim School of Business, and she is a longtime faculty fellow at the Center for Emerging Markets. Um, with that, Sheila, I'll turn it over to you to welcome everyone to our event and introduce our speaker. Thank you so much, Catherine. And welcome everyone. You're in for a real treat today uh, by my colleague and very dear friend, uh, Daniel Satinsky. I met Dan uh, at the US-Russia Business Council meeting in 1988, the very exciting times of when uh, the Soviet Union was opening up. Uh, Gorbachev had, had made the decision to restructure the economy and to introduce greater transparency in society. And uh, Dan and I were eager to get started because we had uh, devoted a lot of our um, uh, our education to uh, that part of the world, business and management uh, in the Soviet Union. And we both learned Russian uh, as well. So in any case, Dan uh, is here um, showing uh, the two sides of, of uh, his professional life. One, he is an independent researcher and has published numerous articles and uh, books, um, including the book Hammer and Silicon, uh, the um, Soviet diaspora in the US innovation economy that he co-authored with myself and uh, Daniel McCarthy, a distinguished professor, university distinguished professor at Northeastern. Um, Dan also, uh, has been a technology commercialization consultant, and he spent a lot of time from the late 80s until 2014 in that role, traveling all over Central Asia and the former Soviet Union, uh, being involved in uh, such projects as uh, rare earth oxides, telecommunications, software outsourcing, and commercialization of early stage technologies. Dan, I'm happy to say is a graduate of Northeastern's Law School, and he has a Master of Law and Diplomacy from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. Um, please give a warm uh, welcome to Daniel Satinsky. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Sheila and Catherine. Thank you to the Center for Emerging Markets for giving me this uh, opportunity. It's, uh, it's great to be on the same program with my friend Sheila and our collaborator in a, a form, uh, my previous, our previous book about the uh, impact of ex-Soviet citizens on the U.S. economy in uh, the um, in the eighties and nineties, and the current book that I just was just published in July, creating the post-Soviet Russian market economy through American eyes is the kind of flip side of the work that um, Sheila and Dan and I did together. It is focused not about ex-Soviets in the US, but about Americans in, in Russia. And the story of a very um, turbulent and historic period of time uh, in, uh, in that history. Now I'm gonna switch to my slide view. Uh, okay, here we go. So here we have the, uh, um, let me get rid of these, okay. And so just to illustrate uh, a bit what uh, Sheila uh, said to you is that this book is really, um, it's based somewhat on my own experience uh, in Russia during this period. But because of that experience, I was really aware of the <clears throat> extent of the American participation in the changes in Russia. And I wanted to preserve that. Um, I wanted to preserve that history and, and thought about doing it through interviews. Uh, this was a period which is the largest uh, interaction of Russians and Americans in history, and is not well recognized in the U.S. So, you know, the pictures here are, you know, there I am in 
uh, in Rome with our joint venture, Rustel and Telecommunications in the board of directors meeting. Um, in the bottom left, uh, Tomsk in Siberia with the statue of Pushkin who never actually was in uh, Tomsk. And, uh, and then to the right in the Yakutia with a, a native healer in Yakutia. So this is, this excuse is- me, Dan, Excuse me, Dan, I don't, yeah. believe, um, I don't see your slides. I don't know whether- Oh, I'm not, okay, hold on. Then I- Right, I don't think either are making the same point, yeah. Right, okay. Well, I'm sorry about that, folks. Here, hopefully, yes. Perfect. Yeah. That's great, Dan. Thanks. Yes. All right. Okay. So you missed my uh, description of the photos here, um, but that's not critical. Um, in any event, the book, uh, as it developed, was going to be based on interviews, just like Hammer and Silicon was. And our, uh, I, my original idea was to, um, to interview 25 to 30 people, ended up interviewing over 105, um, and was only able to use portions of the interviews of 65 of those people. Um, it None of them had a particular analytic framework. Mostly people talked about their experience, what they did, what happened, how they saw things at the time. And the the my job as the author was to select uh, what aspects of those interviews to use, but to put them in a framework. So today's presentation uh, really will be a bit of stories and a bit of analysis that I've put together for the book. Uh, I thought a lot about how to make this relevant to a center for emerging markets. Um, and uh, can I, I'm sorry, but in the screen sharing, are you all seeing pictures of people in the corner? Is there, no, you're seeing the slides? Excellent, okay, thank you. Um, so, how is how is the story of Russia in the 90s relevant to a center for emerging markets? Um, Russia is usually treated as a subject of study in isolation, uh, partly because of the political conflicts between the US and the Soviet Union. Um, but in over the course of the, the decade of the 90s, Russia began to be treated as part of and the emerging markets uh, world. So in when the term BRICS was coined in uh, 2001, Goldman Sachs included Russia as the R in the BRICS. And, the, and to a certain extent, what the process of the 90s was uh, this economic transformation from being uh, a Soviet autarkic autarkic separate world power economy to being uh, considered to be part of the global integrated economy, um, which was a huge transformation. I'm not sure that the Russians uh, were necessarily happy with being considered to be an emerging market, but that's another uh, part of the story. But um, just just before I get into more of the details, I just think it's important to understand the significance of this transformation. You have to look at this in the Soviet Union, there was officially no private property. Entrepreneurship and business was illegal, could go to jail for that. And uh, finance or money did not determine economic activity. That was decided by, um, not by stock markets, but by central planning agencies. So when we look at what has what happened in Russia over the 90s, the key uh, aspects, and some of which I'm, we're going to talk about today, have to do with privatization, that is the institution of private property, 
the integration of Russia into global financial and business systems, and the creation of new sectors of the economy that did not exist. Um, the other sort of framework that I put this in is that um, Russia, Russia historically has had periods in which it's felt that it's behind and needs to modernize. And there is a pattern be, dating back to Peter the Great uh, and including Stalin of opening up Russia to Western experts, bringing those experts in to modernize the economy, uh, but never with the idea of allowing a foreign power to have much control over the uh, Russian society and economy. So so this model is critical to understanding uh, some the processes that took place in the 90s as well, in the 80s and 90s as well, as I'll kind of illustrate with some of the stories. Um, so as Sheila uh, mentioned in the 80s, uh, the Soviet Union, began to uh, open to the West. And this process of opening really actually began somewhat before Gorbachev and represented a kind of trend in Russian society. Um, and it was accompanied by an interest in the United States from uh, to engage with Russia. Uh, this was on the American side, it was a concern about nuclear war about the fear of a nuclear exchange and nuclear winter. On the Russian side, it was uh, more, um, I would say, not, not unofficial, but um, not mainstream interests in modernizing the economy and getting access to technology. So these two different interests ended up uh, coinciding in joint activities between the two sides. Um, and citizen diplomacy is um, in the period of the 80s when uh, the actual diplomacy between the two countries was uh, highly antagonistic, that there was um, a whole period of citizen diplomacy in which peace activists were trying to engage the Soviets with the idea that if we only understood each other better, then we wouldn't blow each other up. And these photos illustrate some of these, um, these activities. Um, I don't have enough time to do this in as the detail that I would like, but um, the, uh, the bottom left is really uh, is Jim Hickman and John Denver, you'll see there. Uh, Hickman was the director of the Esalen Institute's uh, um, uh, Soviet American Exchange Program. This, be, this was a formalized exchange, but within the citizen diplomacy movement, um, Hickman actually took John Denver as one of the first American uh, musicians to the Soviet Union in 1985. But the one, I would think more meaningfully, uh, there were these exchanges of Soviet uh, political leaders. So the picture of Yeltsin there at the top in a grocery store is from a visit that he made sponsored by the Esalen Institute um, in 1989. And he, Hickman and the entourage were driving uh, Yeltsin to Johnson City Space Center Yeltsin saw a grocery store, Randall's, and said, pull over, I want to go in. So they pulled over, he went in, he walked up and down the protos aisles, he came back and, and was um, uh, screaming at the um, at his handlers and at the uh, Esalen people saying, you've tricked me, you set this up, this is a way of making the Soviet Union look bad. And they finally convinced him that it was not, that it was a typical American grocery store. And uh, Yeltsin wrote in his biography about how meaningful this experience was to him. And two years later, he actually quit the Communist Party. 
So these uh, experiences did have an impact on the relations between the two countries. This, uh, as Gorbachev came into power, his goal was to modernize socialism. And so he was uh, looking for ways to bring um, Western technology and investment in uh, to the Soviet Union. The corner, the picture at the top right is of Joel Schatz, who's another um, peace activist who wrote to the Soviet mission in uh, 1983, saying he and his wife would like to come there because they had a peace trek, which is a uh, art project they had to promote peace. So he was invited. He went there with his wife. He got introduced to a vice president of the um, Russian Academy of Science, uh, the Soviet Academy of Sciences. And um, they began to talk about the, the interest in the Soviet uh, Academy of Sciences is in bringing Westerners to the to Russia and to the Soviet Union to invest, to refresh the economy. Uh, Schatz, who knew nothing about technology, assisted them in setting up the very first uh, computer exchange between the Russian Academy of Sciences and the New Jersey Institute of Technology in 1985, and then later set up the, one of the first joint ventures to bring uh, e internet, and he was the first a uh, private commercial telecom company in the Soviet Union in 1989 as part of the uh, joint venture. So these joint ventures were an expression of the very first kind of American impact or influence on what was then the Soviet economy. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, this influence just mushroomed. And uh, I've listed here um, on the left, a number of the programs that uh, were the leading programs in uh, in the interchange and support that the U.S. government funded to for um, Boris Yeltsin. In uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, very soon thereafter, the U.S. government implemented 215 programs from 23 different departments and individual agencies. The largest were from USAID, USDA, um, and the Department of Defense. And the USAID alone in the years 1990 to 1994 spent 3.5 billion on programming and 10 billion in credits for various programs. So there were lots of stories from the people I interviewed uh, that were um, in uh, from these different agencies. But as an illustration, I think of one of the of one that made an impact on me and was, I think, illustrates the breadth of the American um, uh, influence and engagement with Russia was one that was uh, told to me by the one of the founders of Project Harmony, which was a New Hampshire organization that originally, originally began as a peace organization and then got funded to, by the USAID to expand in all kinds of uh, exchanges and citizen exchanges. They were contacted, the Project Harmony was contacted by a group of police officers from Lemonster, Massachusetts, which for those of you not around Massachusetts, small town in central Massachusetts, about taking a delegation of police officers to, uh, to Russia. And they Project Harmony organized a group of about 30 police officers from Fitchburg, Medford, Lemonster, and some uh, Massachusetts state police to go to, um, to um, uh, Petrozavodsk in uh, Karelia, north of St. Petersburg. They brought with them uh, gifts of armored vests, batons, and a drug sniffing dog. This led to a, a series of exchanges uh, between the two uh, 
between the areas and then later a whole program that Project Harmony instituted uh, with police agencies around Russia. This was uh, a part of a, an, an, an infusion of foreigners into Russia in this period. Um, and the infusion of foreigners created an expat community, mostly in Moscow and St. Petersburg, um, with its own institutions, uh, its newspapers, a basketball game on Red Square, and uh, American Chamber of Commerce, which at one time had over 500 members. As part of this change that took place, and in fact critical to it, was privatization. And privatization is a very controversial uh, topic um, as to who initiated and what purposes. What my, um, the position I take in the book is that privatization, and, and I think it was supported by what Russian uh, leaders at the time said was, the privatization was a way to prevent the reemergence of socialism, that it was the primary uh, policy of the Yeltsin reformers. And uh, um, Anatoly Chubais, who was one of the leaders of privatization, referred to them as kamikazes. They knew that they had to, um, to privatize as fast as possible because there would be a reaction against privatization. And they expected that uh, they would lose their positions, maybe even go to jail if as part of this process. But it was their initiative to uh, prevent the reemergence of, uh, of socialism. And they looked around for where they could get the expertise to help them implement the privatization. And the, uh, the, the, one of the early supports was through Harvard and Harvard Institute of International Development. This is where most people think of Jeffrey Sachs and shock therapy, that this was uh, sometimes referred to as the uh, Harvard hoodwinking the Russians into doing this uh, program, which hurt the Rus hurt uh, the Russian public. I think this is absolutely wrong. Harvard did what the reformers wanted. Uh, Harvard later then got in trouble because some of the people uh, involved in this program uh, were charged with insider trading uh, because they got involved in privatization in a uh, not an ethical way and it led to a suit by the federal government against uh, HIID and the disbanding, disbanding of that um, organization. But even more uh, important for this was the Credit Suisse team. Uh, after Harvard put its program out, the Russian uh, privatization office asked for uh, proposals from investment banks to help implement it. And a third generation Russian American, Boris Jordan, whose uh, family uh, uh, had fought against the Bolsheviks, um, convinced Credit Suisse that they should do this for nothing. And Jordan and put together a team and they uh, transformed the Harvard uh, intentional program into the actual coupon uh, auctions for privatization. And later Boris Jordan be, uh, took his team out of Credit Suisse and formed his own company uh, called Renaissance. The, as this privatization took place and uh, shares and companies then began to be uh, traded through these vouchers in a very primitive way. And many Russian uh, uh, companies were turned into joint stock companies. There were no financial markets. Again, back to what I said in the beginning, money played a different function in the Soviet Union. It wasn't an arbiter of economic activity. So there was no experience with this with a financial system of the type that we have in the West. So the expertise that the Russians uh, got came again, not 
exclusively, but a lot from the United States. So the first Russian uh, stock exchange, the uh, or the most, what became the dominant one, the RTS, was set up by an American, Fred Berliner, financed by USAID, uh, using NASDAQ uh, uh, secondhand software and uh, with the assistance of the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. The many of these investment banks that uh, then were set up to deal in the new shares um, had foreign connections. Uh, Troika Dialogue was one of the most well known. Troika was um, it was actually a, formed out of a, a joint venture from Gorbachev times, which was. Uh, called Dialogue, and Peter Derby, who was the American, again, third generation Russian emigre, who uh, founded Dialogue, was instrumental in setting up Troika Dialogue. Uh, most of these investment banks traded in shares with foreigners. Russians at this stage did not really have much use for our understanding of uh, share markets, but Foreigners did and wanted a piece of the uh, rapidly privatizing Russian market, and many fortunes were made at this period uh, in trading in the shares. The private equity groups also came in um, and in many ways were more important because they reached deeper into the Soviet, uh, um, post-Soviet ec economic uh, activity and industry. So these uh, various funds uh, had, in most cases, Russian partners or Russian roots. Um, to me, one of the interesting ones was uh, the Russia Partners at the bottom. Uh, Russia Partners was actually a group that uh, was fam formed by Payne Weber and the Russian Orthodox Church with the blessing of the Russian government. And the purpose for the church was to fund its restoration of church properties that were being turned over by them by the Russian government. And obviously Payne Weber was there to make money. Um, one of the notable uh, enterprises that was founded by Russia Partners was uh, the Russian MTV, which turned out to be a very pop popular and a uh, profitable um, business. The, again, real estate, uh, there was no private property. So while Russians had a lot of experience in constructing things, they didn't have a, a really any experience in uh, real estate as a, a, as a private business. And so the expertise they needed came uh, uh, from foreigners and from engaging foreigners. So in uh, one of the in, in terms of residential real estate, one of the first things that the Yeltsin government did was to uh, privatize apartments. So previously you would have a right to live in an apartment, but you didn't own it. But now you could uh, privatize it. And there was a huge demand from foreigners looking to rent apartments. It was a source of capital, but Russians didn't know how to hook that market together. That was done by the enterprising American expats who then later grew their businesses into full-scale um, uh, brokerages, which were purchased by the international brokers at a later stage. Um, the middle picture here is, is uh, Pokrovsky Hills, which was the first um, uh, townhouse development, all for foreigners, but later Russians also lived there. And then in the bottom is a mall in Yaroslavl, a picture that I took in 2017, just to show uh, how, how much Russia became integrated into, um, into the world uh, system of real estate. Um, I'm going to run out of time, so I'm going to have to be a little more brief than I would like with this. But the hotels and restaurants also was a sector of the 
uh, Russian economy that was underdeveloped or wasn't present uh, in the earlier days, in the Soviet days. So um, much of the demand, early demand, was driven by foreigners who wanted a good restaurant. Uh, the bottom picture is Starlight Diner, which uh, was um, founded by a group of Americans who played basketball together at the American Embassy. And we're looking, they were musing that wouldn't it be great if they had a place like Denny's to go to after the basketball game, playing basketball. So they decided to form a company and import and these diners from the U.S. and into Moscow and bring in American food. Um, the the top picture, Rostek, is a fast chicken fast food restaurant that was uh, founded by the company Rossin Tour, the bottom on their list here. And uh, it was an, uh, an adaptation of American fast food. Prior uh, to the breakup of the Soviet Union, Russians typically did not go to restaurants. There were some cafeterias, the Stolovaya, that they would go to, but the uh, the uh, private sector blossomed with these new fast food restaurants that were modeled on the Western models. There was also a huge cultural impact and lots of different ways um, of, um, of uh, foreigners and Americans in particular. Um, the picture, uh, I, I again, I'm going to be running out of time, so I'm going to try to be brief here and not tell you as many stories as I would like. But the the um, the red M here was the first FM station in uh, in Russia, Radio Maxim. Uh, it came on the air on December 25th, 1991, the same time that Gorbachev abdicated power and the, Soviet, and, and the Soviet Union became Russia. It was dedicated to, it was formed, uh, founded by an American, Peter Gerwey, who had been involved with the citizen diplomacy movement and met Russians that way. Um, and it was a completely commercial station. It was the first FM station. First song it played was um, the Beatles, All You Need Is Love. And the second one was the Beatles uh, back in the USSR. Um, the Coca-Cola sign here was um, the uh, one of the first outdoor advertising in uh, in Russia, and this was organized by John Rose of Rose Creative Strategies, a Bostonian who became involved with marketing in uh, in Russia and then the Soviet Union. Um, I put Cosmopolitan here because this is the cover of the first issue of Cosmopolitan in Russia. It had it was founded uh, by the owners of the Moscow Times that. Uh, the English language paper that I showed previously. The Moscow Times was um, uh, a, news, a news and reliably news source for the expat community, but it was a money loser. Uh, it was supported by ads, but it certainly wasn't uh, making enough money to continue. So the owners, Derek Sauer and Ellen Sauer, uh, wanted to find um, a magazine format that would work and would become commercially successful. So they pursued Hearst and got an agreement with a joint venture to publish Russian Cosmopolitan. This at, at a time when the only uh, women's magazines in Russia were farm woman, and factory woman. And this was a cultural phenomenon when it was published. The editions ran to 800 pages and 600 pages of them were ads. So it pulled along the ad industry, but it also changed the cultural views of uh, and exposure 
of Russian women to uh, to Western feminism and uh, it had a huge cultural impact. So the point I want to make, I think I want you to go away from this uh, presentation is that there were uh, these structural changes that took place and the structural changes in which Americans played a leading role, not the only role. Europeans were important as well, but I didn't have space to cover that. Um, that these, um, many of them are still lasting and still uh, relevant for the future. You, I, I guess because it's a lunchtime presentation, I, uh, I went to the food to illustrate the changes here, but the top photo is a of a Soviet restaurant. The next photo is the opening of McDonald's um, and the crowds that uh, formed around it. And as I indicated, the way that's transformed how ordinary Russians uh, eat and their relationship to restaurants. And then the bottom is the food court in the uh, Yaroslav um, in the Yaroslav Mall that I showed you previously. So this transformation led to Russia being part of the BRICS. It became known in, as a, uh, a market economy. It was uh, a destination for investment. Um, but the point I want to make is that even as that was taking place and recognized in 2000, Russia had already started to go its own way and turning away from the West as early as 1998, 1999, that um, the Russians had over the decade of the 90s um, learned the skills of running businesses, of running their own economy, and there was a growing uh, resentment of foreigners, if you will, as some Russians expressed to me, telling us how to live, that there was a, a proto-nationalism that was growing up as early as the end of the 90s and the 1998 global financial crisis kind of sealed that, uh, sealed the deal that uh, Russians were now capable of running things themselves and that there were risks to being too heavily integrated into the world um, financial system. Uh, it was analogous to uh, the whole history of Russia of opening to the West, utilizing technology and then closing uh, and never intending to give up control. Whereas the many in the US uh, thought of Russia as a loser in the Cold War and as a country that was referred to as being in a virtual receivership to the West by uh, Zygmunt Zygmunt Brzezinski in the early 90s, Russia saw itself as a modernizing world power. And this difference of point of view is really critical to understanding uh, what happens over the course of the 2000s and its background to the situation we find ourselves in now. It became a market economy. It's based on private property. It has not gone back to central planning, but it is not the same kind of economy as the West. So it is not a return to the USSR. Um, uh, and, uh, but I think, it's also important to recognize that I don't I don't see any evidence that the Russian reformers of the 1990s were really committed to build democratic institutions. They were showcase institutions, but not real ones. And so um, we didn't really understand their goals and what they were intending to do. And so we were operating based on our own understanding. Um, and we have consistently underestimated or not uh, evaluated 
uh, completely uh, how Russia sees the world and its goals. So I put the cover Atlantic Magazine from 1999. Uh, after the financial crisis, it says Russia is finished. This has consistently been um, a, a, a feeling that's raised uh, or not a, a conclusion that's been made about Russia that has proved incorrect at every point. And uh, we can see that um, this, uh, and, and so I think that it's important to recognize that Russia is not going away. It is a historic world power that is uh, of continuing importance. Uh, by saying that, it is no way excusing any of its behavior in uh, in the uh, invasion of Ukraine. I think that that at the same time we would be making mistake if we don't uh, continue to look more deeply into uh, the processes is driving Russia because sooner or later we will uh, re-engage and hopefully some of the experience of citizen diplomacy, some of the lessons of the 90s will help with that re-engagement and also assist us in whatever processes of rebuilding of Ukraine when that becomes possible that we may engage in. So I know that I've gone longer than I would have liked. I have a lot to say and I hope you will consult the book. You'll look at the book and I'll be happy to answer uh, any questions uh, that you may have. All right, thank you. Sheila, it's over to you. Thank you so much, Dan. And you can uh, stop sharing your screen now and we will be able to see you um, as a full picture there. Great. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for joining. And please put your questions in the chat. Uh, those of you who would like to comment and or ask Dan a question. And while you're doing that, if you don't mind, Dan, I... Uh, have at least one question that I would like to pose to you. And that is your, uh, uh, the, the interviewees, these business people you interviewed um, in the United States, how did they build trust with uh, the people from the former Soviet Union who in virtually every case had had no interaction with people from the West? It's a... Uh... Oh, well, that's a complex, complex question to ask. So, first of all, the people that I interviewed are people who ended up um, being successful in Russia and who liked being there. There's a whole set of other people who didn't like being there, who didn't like the culture, who didn't build any trust. So, um, this book is skewed towards. The uh, those who who did integrate themselves, in most cases, it had to do uh, with a long term interest, maybe some family connection, uh, studying of the language, being willing to uh, learn from Russians rather than to exclusively be teachers of Russians, and I think there's a critical difference in that uh, in that. I think also that in the initial stages, the Russians reached out to people they knew through citizen diplomacy. So it, Russians like to do things with people they know. They don't like to work with strangers. So there was uh, an initial pull from, the, from that citizen diplomacy group to bring as contacts to find trustworthy partners. And that process was a difficult one on both sides. Thank you, Dan. You know, this, the trust uh, component is essential to uh, having successful collaborations and particularly when uh, uh, in this situation. Uh, yeah. I am now turning to the chat and uh, we have uh, Adam Blanco. Thank you for documenting this important period of time in Russian history, Dan. Great presentation. In your opinion, what are the lessons learned applicable to the reconstruction of Ukraine and or uh, Russia post-Putin era and emerging markets? Well, there. Are, thanks, Adam. And uh, Adam, by the way, is one of the 
first Peace Corps volunteers in Russia and was someone I interviewed uh, for the book. Um, and is a, a also currently putting out his own newsletter about Russia called uh, Barbershop Whispers. But in any event, um, the some of the lessons have to do with the issue that Sheila just raised about uh, trust in that learning to listen as well as tell, uh, trying to understand the actual motives of your partner, what it is they're trying to accomplish rather than just focusing, focusing exclusively on what you're trying to uh, accomplish. And uh, another would be to not expect uh, either Ukraine or post-Putin Russia to look like the US or to try to force it into uh, that sort of construct because it won't work. Um, these are historic cultures with their own cultural characteristics that require looking more deeply into what it is the people of those countries are trying to accomplish in a system in that uh, it, to the extent it complies with your values uh, rather than expecting them to become just like you. Um, so I think that's those are important aspects of uh, how we can approach in both cases. Thank you, Dan. We now have a question from Mike uh, uh, DeMore McKim, uh, colleague, marketing professor, Jay Mulkey. Jay is asking, I read somewhere that Russia was expecting the US to come up with a plan similar to the Marshall Plan to help Russia transition to a market economy. Is that true? Um, you know, in as far as I know, this idea of the Marshall Plan is more in Western sources than in Russian sources. So there is this debate about, well, so-called, how did we lose Russia? In that we didn't um, uh, put enough resources into the 90s to accomplish America's goals in Russia. And to the Marshall Plan sort of reconstructed Germany as a part of the world economy in the image of uh, Western Europe. I'm not sure that that was really the objective of the Russian uh, leadership at the time, that it, that more money might not really have accomplished anything more than uh, what was accomplished. I think that unless you understand what it is they were trying to do, money just becomes something else to be siphoned off and uh, taken off to Switzerland. Um, you know, it it did it 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 didn't comport with what they were trying to accomplish, and so I think that this Marshall Plan is sort of a false flag, if you will. Thank you. And now we have a question from Mark Duma. Uh, from 1990 to 1994, I was trying to transfer technology from Russia without success. Besides laser eye surgery, do you know of anyone who was successful? <laughs> Good question. Um, there were there were some uh, successes there. Well, if you look at um, and again in the laser area, there's um, and I'm blanking on the name of the company, but Massachusetts um, has one of the most important laser technology companies in the world, which was a Russian scientist who brought his whole team first to Germany and then got um, support from Massachusetts to build his factory here. And I'm completely blanking on his name, but I apologize for that. Um, but there, uh, there have been other uh, successes um, sm on smaller and larger scale, but there were um, voice, there was 
uh, handwriting recognition technology that was incorporated by Apple in their um, uh, early uh, um, handwriting recognition devices. Uh, there were chips that were used by Texas Instruments for voice processing that came from Russia. There was uh, a phone called, I think it was the Happy Jack or some, it was Apple, uh, not Apple, it was uh, Radio Shack, uh, when we still had Radio Shack, had a mobile phone that used uh, voice processing technology from, from Russia. There were, have been, there was a very successful Russian uh, software engineering industry, which was basically outsourcing, but more than that. Um, so not strictly tech transfer. Um, but there were instances of success. Yeah. Great. Um, we had a comment from Myra Lee, uh, who just reminded us that IREX provided internet access at many libraries during that period of time as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Other questions or comments? While you're putting them into the chat, I have another one. Um, Dan, any regrets that your interviewees uh, expressed huh. how, how they did business there? Wow, that, you know, um, you mean, did they express that they wish they'd done things differently? That's uh, an interesting question. Um, I don't believe that I had much that people said, I wish I had done differently. What I did, and understand that this is not a unified block of people. These are people, some of whom didn't know each other. Uh, and But there were criticisms of how uh, foreigners acted in the Russian market. So many of the people, they didn't talk about their own regrets. They talked about unethical behavior by their competitors and um, foreign competitors. So uh, companies coming in and trying to steal their staff, companies coming in and paying bribes when they shouldn't have, when the, then they, rather giving a bad example. Um, foreigners, mm, so coming in and taking advantage of Russians. Um, so there was a lot of, and there was a lot of bad behavior by foreigners in, in Moscow, um, in St. Petersburg. But uh, so it was more about how people implemented what they did, but by others rather than regrets about what they didn't do themselves. Um, I would say that was more prevalent. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, it does. And I think that it underscores the point that um, those who entered uh, uh, that new market uh, were opportunists and they were risk takers and yeah. uh, they weren't always doing things on the up and up. Yeah, I think that that many foreigners felt that the laws didn't apply to them, that we were sort of had a charmed existence. That we could kind of do what we want. And there was a, a it was almost, a, oh, I don't know. There's a mixed reaction to things like uh, fire regulations and health and sanitary re regulations. The way it's usually portrayed is that um, this was just an excuse to take bribes, uh, that the Russian officials were doing that. But there were other cases in which it was simply, there's a legal regime, you're supposed to comply with it, you're in another country. You're, as most of the people I interviewed said, we were guests in that country. And so we had to comply, we have to comply with their laws. But uh, there was another whole set of people who felt the laws didn't apply to them. And if they didn't like the laws, they tried to get them changed. I mean, we, we there were accounts uh, in the interviews of um, 
foreign officials going to the Russian Duma and trying to blackmail them in to basically blackmail them into changing laws to make them fit what that agency wanted or to remove some obstacle to a program that they wanted. And they just felt that, you know, they could kind of do what they wanted. So that there was a good bit of that. What do you think is the lasting legacy of uh... Uh, the American uh, business involvement in the transformation of Russia. Well, as I, I tried to say, there there is a lasting legacy in kinds of the structure of everyday life. Um, I mean, Russians uh, lease in their own their apartments. They um, they there there is a real estate industry. There are restaurants there are the many, many of the institutional changes structural changes still remain there is a declining goodwill it's sort of uh, i would say through the citizen exchanges people got to make friends and know people that is rapidly going away by people who have left, Russians who have fled the country based on its current politics and, and an aging of the population so that the young people don't know uh, Americans. They never met them. And this uh, wall that existed in the uh, Cold War is reconstructed in a, even more uh, strongly than in the past. So the legacy is passing away. Yes, but as you said, Russia is not passing away, so. No, no, Russia is not passing away. So, it, you know, that the anecdote of Russia not passing away is uh, uh, I I went to the city of Uglich in the Yaroslav Oblast in the 90s and drove into the city and there's a sign with the name Uglich and was founded in 937. And if you think about a country that has a thousand year history or more, it's seen many changes and ups and downs, but it's still there. And it would be a real mistake to discount, discount it or to cancel it or to think it won't still be there and important in some form or other based on this history. Thank you, Dan. Uh, we just have a minute left. Don't really have time for you to answer Irina Novikova's question, uh, but I will mention it in a moment. Dimitri shared um, in uh, response to our prior discussion that he's a he was a co-founder of the American Medical Center in Moscow, right. which, which is a, a bright spot for sure. Yeah. Right. Then I'll just leave us with uh, Irina's question. Um, which is what do you think of the Russian community in the US? Should there be any continuation of working with them at the moment? If you have a 30 second response that-, that Yeah, would... yeah. I think that um, the Russian community in the US is an entry point for the future for us in dealing with Russia. Um, I think that it's a mistake to uh, ostracize every Russian as if they were Putin and Putin policies. Um, and collective blame is not